Over the past year, we've seen the release of quite a few Core XY printers, as each company launches their version to battle it out in the growing lineup of options. Out of the companies that release machines on a fairly regular cadence, Elihu kept us waiting longer than most. But in February, they launched the Centauri and the Centauri Carbon. While the announced specs looked pretty good, the thing that caught most by surprise was the announced price. I'm not sure if this is more of a launch price or how it's even going to hold up with the increased cost to imports, but at the time of recording, the Centauri is listed at $199 and the Centauri Carbon is listed at $299. This makes it extremely competitive and explains why the first batch of the Centauri Carbon sold out very quickly and have been on pre-order since. Elegu sent over the Carbon version this past January for testing, so I've had plenty of time to poke around at the printer and see what it's all about. In today's video, we'll be diving into the Centauri Carbon. We'll go over its specs, what setup was like, how it's performed, and I'll give you my overall thoughts based on my time with it so far. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Thanks to Voxel PLA for sponsoring today's video. Used exclusively in a 150 machine print farm, they now offer 21 colors of PLA plus and 10 colors of PETG plus. Both are available at the low price of $16.99. This is an excellent choice for anyone needing reliable and affordable materials, even for more demanding applications. Filament performance is excellent even on high-speed printers. Bulk discounts are available along with free shipping in the US when you order three or more rolls. Voxel PLA also provides high-quality 3D printer upgrades, such as the Bento Box 2-stage filter and the Bamboo Lab AMS Python, along with many others. Check out the link in the description to voxelpla.com to find out more about their high quality affordable filaments and printer upgrades. Starting with the specs, the Centauri Carbon is a fully enclosed Core XY 3D printer with a build volume of 256 millimeters in X, Y, and Z. The printer is largely made up of steel paneling with a glass top and glass front door and a fair bit of injection molded parts for a lot of the printer assembly inside the machine. For motion, X, Y, and Z all ride around on linear rods, and the bed travels up and down on three lead screws. Looking at the tool head, the front cover is only held on by magnets, so pulling it forward lets you easily remove it. Even with this out of the way, much of the tool head is still hidden, but the top section contains the direct drive extruder, and beneath it we have a fairly large heatsink, long heater block, and the hot and cooling fan. Mine came pre-installed with a 0.4mm nozzle that appears to be made of brass with a hardened insert for printing with abrasives. One thing I found interesting is what appears to be a filament cutter built into this tool head. That combined with the poop chute on the back makes this almost ready for multicolor printing. Elegoo does have a little picture graphic on the product page for this saying that it is coming in Q3, but aside from that, I haven't heard anything from them directly, so I have no idea what the add-on is going to look like or how it's all going to integrate with the existing Centauri Carbon. On the back side of the toolhead cover is a beefy 5020 blower fan for your part cooling. In addition to that fan, there is a large auxiliary fan located at the back of the printer that moves a lot of air when enabled. The housing containing the auxiliary fan also has an exhaust fan with a carbon filter in front of it. Accessing it requires moving the five screws holding the front of that fan shroud in place, so it's a bit of work, but it's there and I imagine some sort of refillable cartridge that's easier to access wouldn't be that hard to add for those that are interested. The bed of the printer uses a magnetic flex plate system and the bed surface is dual sided with one side having a thicker texture that's more in line to what I'm used to seeing on powder coated beds and the other side still having some texture but much finer. For bed leveling the Centauri Carbon uses load cells with one at each of the corners of the bed to generate its mesh. While the Centauri Carbon does have three lead screws to move the bed up and down, it only has a single motor, so all of those lead screws are tied together using a single belt. I would have loved to have had tramming on this printer, but given the price that Elegoo seems to have been trying to achieve, I understand this as being one of the places that they were able to maybe cut some cost. 
Other things to note on the inside is that there is a nozzle brush at the back of the printer and a camera in the front right corner to let you wirelessly monitor your prints. Interfacing with the printer is done using the 4.3 inch touchscreen located on the bottom right side of the machine. While there is onboard storage letting you send files directly from your computer to the printer, there's also a full-size USB port located at the front of the machine, allowing you to print from a USB flash drive. Moving to the right side of the machine, we have our spool holder and a filament runout sensor. The sensor seems like it's just a simple on-off switch, so it's not going to detect things like clogs, but it did happen to save me when I had a piece of filament break off from the spool and it paused itself. On the back of the printer, there's a couple of vents, one for sucking air in to the auxiliary fan for cooling your prints, and the other one being for that exhaust fan. And at the very bottom, we have our power input and on-off rocker switch. Before powering on the machine for the first time, I flipped it on its back and removed the screws holding in the bottom panel so that we could take a look at the electronics bay. Everything's sort of strategically placed around that belt loop, but there's still quite a bit of open space down there. Here you can see the single belt routed around those lead screws along with the tensioning mechanism. Down there you'll find the SSR for the heated bed, a small 24 volt power supply, and the bright red mainboard. If I remember correctly, in the last couple of Elegoo FDM printers I tested, they were basically using some kind of a white labeled maker base board, and this seems to be a departure from that. As far as setup goes, this was really simple. The process involves removing the shipping foam and box of accessories from inside the printer, cutting a couple of zip ties, removing the bed screws from shipping, and finally mounting the screen and the spool holder. From unboxing to first boot, it really shouldn't take more than maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Upon first boot, the screen will guide you through the entire setup process, from picking the language to running through the pretty long self-check. The self-check verifies that the nozzle's heating correctly, then the bed, along with that the fans are operational, and finally, it runs through input shaping and the bed meshing. The estimation that the printer gives is approximately 30 minutes for that process, and after sitting through it, I've got to say it is pretty close to accurate. The majority of that time goes to the bed mesh. I didn't count it exactly, but it, each spot takes about three to four points, and it was approximately a 10 by 10 mesh. Once that process completed, I went under settings and added the printer to my network over Wi-Fi. With everything ready to go, I loaded up a spool of Voxel PLA and began to print out some of the pre-sliced files, starting with the Benchy. Two things I discovered right away is that the auxiliary fan was really loud and that the inside of this printer was extremely dark. There's no LEDs other than a really small one on the camera that doesn't do much to light up the chamber. This is something I'll probably end up adding myself, but it would have been really nice if they had just included one small LED strip even at the front of the printer just to make it easier to see what's going on while this printer's printing. As for noise at full blast, I measured around 70 decibels with the front door open, and 64 with it closed. The good news is, is that depending on what you're printing, you won't have to have those fans running at full blast, which will help make things a little less noisy. But if your plan is to just push this thing as hard as you can, be prepared for some noise. Overall, I was really impressed with the test prints. And while the Eiffel Tower model had some stringing, given its details and retraction count, the printer did a great job. After the handful of test prints, I was ready to slice up some models of my own. Orca Slicer now has a profile for both the Centauri and Centauri Carbon built in, but this wasn't available through much of my testing, so I installed and used the Elegoo Orca Slicer, which basically looks like just a skinned version of Orca Slicer. Once I did this and went to the device page, I found what looked like a very stripped down version of the Fluid web interface. So I reached out to Elegoo to see if the source code and SSH info would be available for what I believed to be Clipper firmware. However, the response I got stated that the Carbon uses a different architecture with a single chip versus Clipper that uses an SOC and MCU. Because of this, it's not fully compatible with Clipper commands or the Fluid plugin. 
I have no idea what the back end for this thing looks like, but it is worth noting that unless somebody creates a custom image or figures out a crack for the firmware, you are not going to be doing much of any customization with the printer settings. The web interface is also very limiting, and other than a few basic controls, you don't have access to see things like the bed mesh. For some, this will be a non-issue, but for those that were expecting this to be running Clipper or to have access to the backend, I wanted to make sure that you were at least aware. After slicing up my first file, I saved it to a flash drive and brought it over to the printer to start my first job when I noticed that it seemed like the screen had frozen. Thinking it was probably just a fluke, I powered off the machine and powered it back on again, but from that point forward, I was not able to get past the splash screen. When I reached out to Elegoo, they let me know that they had indeed discovered a bug that had since been corrected with an upcoming firmware update. But since that firmware was not yet available, the two options I had were to either send the machine back in and get a new unit or to do a board swap to the printer I had. I really don't love shipping printers, so I opted to just swap out the board myself. Elegoo sent over a PDF that sort of covered some of the basics of swapping out the board, but I found it just as easy to unplug a cable or two at a time, then plug it into the new board and sort of repeat that process until I transferred everything over. Once I had the new board installed, I had to go through the long startup sequence again, but I was finally able to print out the files that I had sliced up myself. Using the default profiles built into their slicer, I fired off a few PLA prints along with a couple of PETG, ABS, and TPU. For the PLA prints, I was pretty happy with the results. And the only thing I found was fine stringing on the Hogwarts castle that had a bunch of small retractions that was easy enough to just clean up with a heat gun. When I switched over to PETG, I started with just a benchy and found some pretty odd artifacts around the walls in the first 10 to 15 millimeters. I had dried the filament prior to printing, so I don't believe it was moisture related and was leaning towards it being maybe something to do with retractions or even pressure advance. Since it seemed like it had sort of cleaned up the further it got into the print, I moved on to printing a much larger print of an octopus, but that one turned out much worse. I had stringing, some zits, and a handful of sections that showed under extrusion. After seeing that repeating issue, I dried a different spool of PETG and printed out a watering can. That print turned out much better, and the main thing I noticed was that there was a bit of a difference in the sheen of the material from when it was printing the slow, solid layers at the beginning to sort of the sped up layers for the rest of that print. Based on this and the under extrusion I saw in the octopus, I believe the main issue is that the profile is just too aggressive. It's not uncommon with the profiles that ship with these machines to have sort of a heavy emphasis on speed with the trade-off being a hit to part quality. For this review, I wanted to use the profile that was provided, but long term for PETG, I would be running flow, temp, retraction, and pressure advance tests to dial this profile in further. With ABS, I discovered another issue that came in the form of the first layer. It seems like approximately half, if not more, of the printers I've tested out lately have an issue with this. When I sliced up some parts I needed for a different printer's upgrade, I noticed that the nozzle was just way too close to the bed, and I can actually hear it dragging as it was going around doing that first layer. This is usually caused by thermal drift, depending on the type of sensor the different manufacturers are using with their printers, or that the printer is probing the machine or doing your Z offset while the bed is cold, and by the time it's actually gotten up to temperature and heated up to where it's going to be printing at, the bed has expanded, and because it probed before that, it wasn't able to account for that. I tried to counter this by setting the bed to 100 Celsius, and letting it sit for a bit before running a print, but it didn't seem to make much of a difference. So on my next attempt, I figured I would just baby step it to the correct height. Well, I had a brief moment of panic as the print started and I went into sort of the print tune menu and didn't see any option to do a Z offset. However, when I reached out to Elegoo about this, they let me know that if I went down to the settings menu, you can still access that during the print, which Feels sort of like a strange place to have this and not incredibly intuitive, but I'm at least happy to report that it is there so you can indeed baby step. This is something that I'm hoping Elegoo can improve on either by allowing for 
multiple Z offsets depending on material or by just improving the logic of how they are grabbing that Z offset. For now, it can definitely print ABS slash ASA, but the first layer issues are going to be a bit annoying. For TPU, I used 95A and I'm happy to report that using the stock settings, it printed this material like a champ. With those default settings, I printed out a couple of adapters I need for my shop vac going into my CNC, and they both turned out really clean. The extrusion was really consistent and the adhesion was excellent. Whew, that was a lot to unpack. And while I always try to be as thorough as I can when I'm doing reviews, I am sure there are still things over the past couple of months that I ran into or wanted to mention, but I just cannot remember them. So what are my thoughts on the Elegoo Centauri Carbon based on my time with it so far? Well, let's start with the good. I'm really pleased with the build quality of this machine and think Elegoo did a solid job of specking it out. The kinematics and hot end extruder combo lets it print quickly and the combination of the 5020 and auxiliary fan means that there is no shortage in cooling. On top of that, having it fully enclosed really opens up its capabilities and sort of material compatibility for those that are interested in that. For areas I feel can be improved, the machine's dark, and while that might not sound like a big deal, it does mean that it's difficult to see always inside what's going on and make sure that your first layer is good, and it also means that the front right camera is just a bit less useful. The firmware being proprietary means there's no easy way to enable variable meshing, setting things like heat soaking, or seeing what your bed mesh looks like. Based on my email to Elegoo about the issue that I experienced with ABS, it sounds like they're working on things, but at this point, we'll have to wait for them to implement these changes. From the experience I had with PTG, it also seems like the profiles that are shipped with this machine could use a bit of additional refinement. At the current $299 price point, this printer checks a lot of boxes and seems like a really good value for someone looking to get their first Core XY printer or maybe someone that's just needing to add an additional printer to their lineup. If they're able to maintain this price point, I can see a fairly large community forming around this printer like we've seen with other popular low cost machines, which can lead to further improvements and even community based upgrades. What I'm curious about is how this printer is going to hold up over time. It seems like Elegoo did a pretty good job of cutting corners where necessary to keep price down without compromising on the machine too much. But there's only so much I can see from playing around with this printer for a couple of months. Once more users have these in their hands, we'll really get a chance to take a look at all of its capabilities in addition to its limitations. And that has been the Elegoo Centauri Carbon. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that I was able to answer the majority of the questions you had. I apologize it took so long to get this video out. I've had quite a few people asking about it, but in my defense, it, it, part of it was because I was waiting on the replacement board and then had to then swap it out. But the video is here now. Um, if you do have any additional questions, let me know and I'll do my best to answer. And as always, if I don't know the answer to your questions, I have no problem reaching out directly to Elegoo to try to get those answers for you. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video just about every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel further, I'll have links in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.